the USS Alabama was built in secrecy in 1862 by British shipbuilders John Ward Sons and Company in Northwest England at their shipyard at Birkenhead Whirl, opposite of Liverpool. The construction was arranged by the Confederate agent, Commander James Bullock, who had the procurement of sorely needed ships for the fledging Confederate States Navy. The contract was arranged through the Fraser Tome Company, a cotton broker in Liverpool with ties to the Confederacy. Under prevailing British neutral law, it was possible to build a ship designed as an armed vessel, provided that it was not actually armed until after it was in international waters. In light of this loophole, the Alabama was built with reinforced decks for cannon placements, ammunition magazines below water level, etc., but was not fitted with armaments or any warlike equipment at its original launching. Initially known only by her shipyard number, ship number 290, she was launched as Enrica on the 15th of May, 1862, and secretly slipped out of Birkenhead on the 29th of July, 1862. The United States Navy Commander, Tunis A.M. Craven, commander of the USS Tuscarora, was in Southampton and was tasked with the intercepting the new ship but was unsuccessful in the endeavor. Agent Bullock arranged for a civilian crew and captain to sail the Enrica to Tariskia Island in the Azores. With Bullock at his side, the new ship's captain, Raphael Simmes, left Liverpool on the 13th of August, 1862, aboard the steamer Bahama to take command of the new cruiser. Simmons arrived at Tuscaroy Island on the 20th of August, 1862, and began overseeing the refitting of the new vessel with various provisions, including armaments and 350 tons of coal, brought there by Greenia, his new ship's supply vessel. After three days' work by the three ship's crews, Enrico was equipped as a naval cruiser designated a commerce raider for the Confederate States of America. Following her commissioning as CSS Alabama, Bullock then returned to Liverpool to continue his secret work for the Confederate Navy. Alabama's British made ordnance consists of six muzzle-loading broadside 32-pounder naval smooth bores, three firing to port, and three firing to starboard and two larger and more powerful pivot guns. The pivot cannons were placed at fore and aft the main mast and positioned roughly amidships along the deck's center line. From those positions, they could be rotated to fire across the port or starboard sides of the cruiser. The fore pivot cannon was a heavy, long-range, 100-pounder, 7-inch bore, 178mm, Blakey, rifled muzzleloader. The aft pivot cannon, a large 8-inch 203mm smoothbore. The new Confederate cruiser was powerful by both sail and by a two-cylinder John Ward and Sons Company, 300 horsepower, 222 kilowatt horizontal steam engine, driving a single Griffiths type twin-bladed brass screw. No, at the time a cylinder was also called an engine. Therefore, the machinery evolved, which had two cylinders, could also be referred to as a pair of engines, as often found in literature. The telescopic funnel could be raised or lowered by chains to disguise the fact that the vessel was a steamer. But the screw retracted using the CERN's brass lifting gear mechanism. Alabama could make up to 10 knots, under sail alone, and 13.25 knots, while her sail and steam power were used together. The ship was purposely commissioned about a mile off Tenerica Island in international waters on the 24th of August, 1862. All the men from the Agrippa and the Bahama had been transferred to the quarterdeck of the Enrica, where 24 officers, 
some of them southerners, stood in full dress uniform. Captain Raphael Simis mounted a gun carriage and read his commission from Jefferson Davis, President of the Confederate States. That authorized him to take command of the new cruiser. Upon completion of the reading, musicians assembled from among the three ship's crews and began to play the tune Dixie as the quartermaster finished hauling down Enrique's British colors. A signal cannon was fired, and the new ship's battle ensign and commissioning pennant were broken out at the peaks of the missing bath and the main mast. With that, the cruiser became the Confederate States steamer, the Alabama. The ship's motto, Help yourself, and God will help you was engraved in the bronze of the great double ship's wheel. Captain Simmons then made a speech about the southern cause to the assembled seamen, few of whom were American, asking them to sign on for a voyage of unknown length and destiny. Simmons had only his 24 officers and no crew to man his new command. When this did not succeed, he offered signing money and double wages paid in gold and additional prize money to be paid by the Confederate Congress for all destroyed Union ships. The men began to shout, hear, hear, in response. Eighty-three seamen, many of them British, signed on for service in the Confederate Navy. Bullock and the remaining seamen then boarded their respective ships for the unit return to England. Seamen still needed another twenty or so men for a full complement, but there were enough to at least handle the new Commerce Raider. The rest would be recruited from the captured crews of raided ships or from friendly ports of call. Many of the 83 crewmen who signed on completed the full voyage. Under Captain Simmons, the Alabama spent her first two months in the Eastern Atlantic, ranging southwest of the Azores and then redoubling east capturing and burning northern merchant ships. After a difficult Atlantic crossing, she continued her cruise in the greater New England region. She then sailed south in the West Indies, where she raised more havoc before finally cruising west into the Gulf of Mexico. There, in January of 1863, the Alabama had her first military engagement. The Alabama looked come upon and quickly sink the Union side wheeler USS Hatters, just off the Texas coast near Galveston, capturing the ship's crew. She then continued further south, eventually crossing the equator, where she took the most prizes of her raiding career while cruising off the coast of Brazil. After a second easterly Atlantic crossing, the Alabama sailed down the southwestern African coast when she continued the campaign against northern commerce. After stopping in at Salabama Bay on the 29th of July, 1863, in order to verify that no enemy ships were in Table Bay, she finally made a much-needed refitting and reprovisioning visit to Cape Town, South Africa. The Alabama is a subject of an African folk song, Dear Corm de Alabama still popular in South Africa today. She then sailed for the East Indies, where she spent six months, destroying seven more ships before finally returning via the Cape of Good Hope en route to France. The Union warships hunted frequently for the Commerce Raider, but on the few occasions Alabama was spotted, she eluded her pursuers by vanishing over the horizon. Altogether, she burned 65 Union vessels the various types, most of them merchant ships. During all the Alabama's rain adventures, captured ships and crews, as well as passengers, were never harmed, but were only detained until they could be placed aboard a neutral ship or placed ashore in a friendly or neutral port. Altogether, the Alabama would conduct a total of seven expeditionary raids, spanning the globe before heading to France for refit and repairs. 
Neil Pema's Eastern Atlantic Expeditionary Raid would commence immediately after commissioning. He set sail for the shipping lanes at southwest and then east of the Azeros, where she captured and burned ten prizes. Most of these were whalers. This soot raid would last from August to September of 1862. The Alabama's New England Expeditionary Raid would begin after Captain Simmons and his crew departed for the northeastern seaboard of North America, along Newfoundland and England, where she ranged as far south as Bermuda and the coast of Virginia, burning ten prizes while capturing and releasing three others. This raid would last from October to November of 1862. The Alabama's Gulf of Mexico Expeditionary Raid would begin as Alabama effected a needed rendezvous with her supply vessel, the CSS Agrippina. Afterwards, she would render aid to Confederate land forces during the Battle of Galveston in coastal Texas by sinking the Union side wheeler, the USS Hatters. This expeditionary raid would last from December of 1862 to the January of 1863. The Alabama South Atlantic Expeditionary Raid was her most successful raiding venture, where she would take 29 prizes while raiding off the coast of Brazil. Here she would recommission the Bark Cornad as the CSS Tuscaloosa. This raiding venture would begin in the February of 1863 and end in July of the same year. The Alabama South African Expeditionary Raid would occur primarily while ranging off the coast of South Africa, and she worked together with the CSS Tuscaloosa. There is little to note of this raid, as there is not much to say in terms of the knowledge behind it. This raid, however, would occur between August of 1863 and September of 1863. The Alabama's Indian Ocean Expeditionary Raid involved a journey nearly 4,500 miles across the Indian Ocean, successfully evading the Union gunboat Wyoming. She took three prizes near the Suda Strait and the Java Sea. This raid would occur between September and November of 1863. The Alabama South Pacific Expeditionary Raid would be her final raiding venture. She took a few prizes in the Strait of Malka before finally turning back toward France for refit and repair. This raid would occur in December of 1863. Upon the completion of her seven expeditionary raids, the Alabama had been at sea for 534 days out of 657, never visiting a Confederate port. She boarded nearly 450 vessels, captured or burned 65 Union merchant ships, and took more than 2,000 prisoners without any loss of life among either prisoners or her own crew. On the 11th of June, 1864, the Alabama would arrive in port at Cherbourg, France. Captain Semi soon requested permission to dry dock and overhaul his ship, necessary after naval action and so long at sea. Pursuing the raider, the American sloop of war, USS Kearsarge, under the command of Captain John Alcrum Walensall, arrived three days later and took up station just outside the harbor. While at his previous port of call, Wilson also telegraphed to Gibraltar to send the old sloop of war U.S. St. Louis with provisions and to provide blockading assistance. The Kearsarge now had the Alabama boxed in with no place to turn. Having no desire to see his worn-out ship decay, and a French dock while quarantined by Union ships, and given his instinctive aggressiveness and a long-held desire once again to engage his enemy, 
Captain Simeus chose to fight. After preparing his ship and drilling the crew for the coming battle during the next several days, Simeus issued it through diplomatic channels, a challenge or hoped for intimidation, to the Kearsarge commander. My intention is to fight to the Kearsarge as soon as I can make the necessary arrangements. I hope these will not detain me more than until tomorrow or the morrow morning at furthest. I beg she will not depart until I am ready to go out. I have the honor to be your obedient servant. R. Simi's Captain On the 19th of June, Alabama sailed out to meet the Union cruiser. Jurist Tom Burnham later wrote, The ensuing battle was witnessed by Edward Mantell, who went out to paint it, and the owner of the English yacht, who had offered his children a choice between watching the battle and going to church. As the Kearsarge turned to meet her opponent, the Alabama opened fire. The Kearsarge waited until the range had closed to less than 1,000 yards. According to the combatants, the two ships steamed on opposite courses in seven spiraling circles, moving south and westerly with a three-knot current. Each commander trying to cross the bow of his opponent to deliver a heavy ranking fire. This is also known as crossing the key. The battle quickly turned against the Alabama due to the superior gunnery displayed by the Kearsarge and the deteriorated state of Alabama's containment powder and fuses. The Alabama's most telling shot, fired from the forward 7-inch 178mm Blakely pivot rifle, hit near the Kearsarge's vulnerable stern post. The impact binding the ship's rudder badly. That rifled shell, however, failed to explode. If it had done so, it would have seriously damaged Kearsarge's steering possibly sinking the warship and ending the contest. In addition, Alabama's too rapid rate of fire resulted in poor gunnery, with many of her shots going too high, and as a result, Kearsarge's outboard chain armor received little damage. Simis later said that he did not know about Kearsarge's armor at the time of his decision to issue the challenge to fight, and in the following years, firmly maintained he wouldn't have never fought Kearsarge if he had known. The Kearsarge hull armor had been installed in just three days, more than a year before while she was in port at the Azeros. It was made using 120 fathoms, or 720 feet, of 1.7 inch or 43 millimeter single link to iron chain and covered hull spaces at 49 feet 6 inches long by 6 feet 2 inches deep. It was stomped up and down to eye bolts with Maryland's and secured by iron dogs. Her chain armor was concealed behind 1 inch deal boards painted black to match the upper hull's color. This chain cladding was placed along Kearsarge port and starboard midsection down to the waterline, for addition protection of her engines and boilers when the upper portion of her coal bunkers were empty. Coal bunkers played an important part in the protection of early steam vessels, such as protected cruisers. A hit to her engine or boilers could easily have left Kearsarge dead in the water, or even caused a boiler explosion or fire that could have destroyed the cruiser. Her armor belt was struck twice during the fight. The first hit by one of Alabama's 32-pounder shells was in the starboard gangway, cutting the chain armor and damaging the hull planking underneath. A second 32-pounder shell exploded and broke a link in the chain armor, tearing away a portion of the deal board covering. Had those rounds come from Alabama's more powerful 100-pounder blinky pivot rifles, they would have easily penetrated, but the likely result it would not have been very serious, as both shots struck the hull a little more than five feet above the waterline. Even if the shots had penetrated Kearsarge's side, they would have missed her vital machinery. 
However, a 100-pound shell could have done a great deal of damage to her interior. Hot fragments could have easily set fire to the cruiser, one of the greatest risks aboard a wooden vessel. A little more than an hour after the first shot was fired, the Alabama was reduced to a sinking wreck by Kira Surge's powerful 11-inch 280mm Dalgeens, forcing Captain Sidney to strike his colors and to send one of his surviving boats to Kira Surge to ask for assistance. According to witnesses, Alabama fired about 370 rounds at her adversary, averaging one round per minute per gun. A fast rate of fire compared to Kearsarge gun crews, who fired less than half that number, taking more careful aim. In the confusion of the battle, five more rounds were fired at Alabama after her colors were struck. Her gun ports had been left open, and the broadside cannon were still run out, appearing to threaten Kearsarge. A handheld white flag at Alabama's stern spanked boom finally halting the engagement. Prior to this, she had her steering gear damaged by shell hits, but the final shot came later when one of Alabama's 11-inch shells tore opening midsection of Alabama's starboard waterline, water quickly rushing through the hull, eventually flooding the boilers and taking her down by the stern to the bottom. As Alabama sank, the injured Simis threw his sword into the sea, depriving Kearsarge's commander, Wilso, of the traditional surrender of the sword, an act which was seen as dishonorable by many at this time. Of her 170 crew, the Alabama had 19 fatalities, 9 killed and 10 drowned, and 21 wounded. Kearsarge rescued most of the survivors, but 41 of Alabama's officers and crew, including Seamies, were rescued by John Lancaster's private British steam yacht, Deerhound, while Kearsarge stood off to recover her rescue boats as Alabama sank. Captain Wilso had to stand by and watch Deerhound sprint his adversary away to England. Simmies and his 41 crew members successfully reached England. Simmies eventually returned to the Confederacy and became a Confederate admiral in the last weeks of the war. The sinking of the Alabama by the Kearsarge is honored by the United States Navy with a battle star on the Civil War campaign streamer. During the battle, Dr. David Herbert Leland, a Briton and the ship's assistant surgeon, tended to the wounded men aboard the Alabama. At one point, the operating cable was shot away. He worked in the wardroom until the order to abandon the ship was finally given. As he helped wounded men into the Alabama's only two functional lifeboats, an abled body sailor attempted to enter one, which was already full. Leland, understanding that the man was capsizing the craft, grabbed and pulled him back, saying, See, I want to save my life as much as you do, but let the wounded men be saved first. An officer in the boat, seeing that Leland was about to be left aboard the stricken Alabama, shouted, Doctor, we can make room for you. Leland shook his head and replied, I will not peril the wounded. Unknown to the crew, Leland had never learned to swim, and he would drown when the ship went down. His sacrifice did not go unrecognized in England, however. In his native village, a memorial window and tablet were placed at Easton Royal Church. Another tablet was placed in Charing Cross Hospital in London, where he attended medical school. During her two years as a commerce raider, the Alabama damaged Union merchant shipping around the world. The Confederate cruiser claimed 65 prizes valued at nearly six million dollars, about ten, one hundred and seventeen million dollars in today's money. In 1862 alone, 28 prizes were claimed. In an apartment development in international law, the U.S. government pursued the Alabama claims. 
against Great Britain for the losses caused by Alabama and other raiders fitted out in Britain. A joint arbitration commission awarded the United States $15.5 million in damages. Ironically, in 1851, a decade before the Civil War, Captain Simmies had observed, Commerce raiders are little better than licensed pirates, and it behooves all civilized nations to suppress the practice altogether. However, the Alabama and other raiders failed in their primary purpose, which was to draw Union vessels away from the blockade of the southern coastline that was slowly strangling the Confederacy. The Confederate government had hoped that panicking shipping companies would force the Union to dispatch ships to protect merchant shipping and hunt down the raiders, a task which always required a proportionately greater force than compared with the numbers of ships attacking. This would become even more apparent decades later, during the Battle of the Atlantic during the Second World War, where the German U-boats would consistently strain out the merchant ships going from Britain to the United States, or from the United States to Britain, and in some cases from Britain or America to the Soviet Union. Union officials proved immovable on the blockade. However, and although insurance prices soared, shipping costs went up, and many vessels transferred it to a neutral flag. Very few naval vessels were taken off the southern blockade. In fact, with clever use of resources and a mammoth shipbuilding program, the Union managed to steadily increase the blockade throughout the war. It also sent vessels to protect merchant shipping and to hunt and destroy the few Confederate raiders and privateers still operating in the Atlantic. In November of 1984, the French Navy mine hunter Cyrique discovered a wreck nearly 200 feet beneath the waves off Cherbourg, France. Later confirmed by Captain Max Gurant to be the remains of the CSS Alabama. In 1988, the non-profit to CSS Alabama Association was founded to conduct scientific exploration of the shipwreck which lies in French waters, but is owned by the United States as a successor to the former Confederate States. A 1989 agreement between the United States and France recognized the wreck as an important heritage resource, establishing a joint French-American scientific committee for its agricultural exploration. The CSS Alabama Association with funding from private donations, signed an agreement in 1995 with the United States Naval History and Heritage Command to manage the archaeological investigation. Over the years, several of the ship's cannons and artifacts have been identified and recovered, including both Blakely 32-pounders, Royal Navy Pattern 32-pounders, and Alabama's Heavy Ordnance a blinky 7-inch 100-pounder, and a 68-pounder smoothbore. The association has worked to make the project international, raising funds in both the United States and France. Further expeditions have recovered numerous artifacts, such as the ship's bell, shot, gun truck wheels, brass tracks for the gun carriages, and personal items like tableware and ordnance commandos. In total, more than 300 artifacts have been raised during a 2002 diving expedition, providing valuable insights into the life aboard the Confederate warship. Many of these artifacts are now preserved in the Underwater Archaeological Branch, Naval History and Heritage Command Conservation Lab. The Alabama is the subject of a sea shanty, Roll Alabama Roll, which was also the basis of a 2014 record of the same name by the British contemporary folk band Bellhead. Alabama's visit to Cape Town in 1863 was passed with a slight spelling change, 
and to South African folklore in the African song Dar Kom Di Alabama. The Alabama Hills in Enroll Country, California, are also named after the vessel. In 1998, the Joyce Verney scholar William Butcher was the first to identify a possible link between the Birkenhead-built Alabama and Captain Nemo's Nautilus from the Jules at Verney 1869 novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Butcher stated, the Alabama, which claimed to have sunk in 75 merchantmen and destroyed by the Unionist Kearsarge of Sherburg on the 11th of June, 1864. This battle has clear connections with Nemo's final attack, also in the English Channel. Jules Verne had himself made a previous comparison between the Birkenhead-built CSS Alabama and the Nautilus in a letter to his publisher, Jules Hetzel, in March of 1869. Other arguments in favor of the connection were made by Birkenhead-born geography teacher John Lamb. From the information that I have managed to find on this topic, it is hard to tell whether or not the Alabama was indeed the basis for the Nautilus in the book 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, but what I will say is that in my opinion it could possibly be that. However, nothing has been proven true or false in this exact simplification. However, please do keep in mind that no matter what the book is truly based off of, it does not change the history or the facts of the Alabama's history or her fate. At the start of the Alabama's writing ventures, Captain Simmies may have had to use an early 1861 Seven Star First National Flag as the battle ensign, possibly the same one flown aboard his previous command, the CSS Sumter. As more southern states succeeded and joined the Confederacy, six additional stars were added to the Stars and Bars before Alabama launched as Enrica in England. One such early battle ensign was salvaged from Alabama's floating debris after the sinking by the USS Kearsarge. And it survives today in the Alabama Department of Archives and History. This salvaged battle ensign, known as the Auxiliary Flag of the CSS Alabama, was found by D. Co. Smith in a Paris upholstered shop in 1884 and later donated to the state of Alabama in 1975. Its dimensions it deviated from the standard Confederate flag regulations having an aspect to ratio of 5 and 9. The dark blue canton features 8 white stars arranged in an unusual pattern, creating an asymmetric appearance. It is possible that this was Alabama's original 7-star battle ensign, later altered to include an additional star when news of an 8th state joined the Confederacy reached a ship. Two other stars and bars battle ensigns attributed to the Alabama also survive. One is a mounted and framed 14-star ensign housed at the Mars Museum in Virginia, which has an negated aspect ratio. The second is displayed at the Pensacola Historical Museum and features a canton with 12 stars in a circle surrounding a larger 13th star at the center. These ensigns provide a glimpse into the variations and flags used by Confederate ships during the Civil War. Four of the Alabama's later style ensigns have survived to the present day. The first is housed in Cape Town Bokap Museum in South Africa, measuring 67 inches by 114 inches. This ensign, distinguished by its large rectangular Southern Cross Canton, was made by Alabama's British crew during a visit to Cape Town, and later given to William Anderson, whose company helped repair the ship. A second stainless banner ensign, made during one of Alabama's port visits to Cape Town, is now located in the Tennessee State Museum. 
The third surviving ensign is a small boat ensign marked with Alabama 290 CSN First Cutter. This 25.5 by 41 inch flag was sold through an auction in 2007 and was initially acquired from a descendant of a USS Kearsarge sailor. A fourth ensign, approximately 36 by 54 inches, is believed to be a replacement boat flag made during Alabama's cruise. It was rescued by W.P. Brooks, Alabama's assistant engineer, and has since been mounted and framed, residing with the Brooks family. The Alabama Department of Archives and History also holds a ceremonial stainless banner ensign known as Admiral Simi's flag. This large silk flag was presented to Captain Simi's by Lady and Dalton and other English supporters after Alabama's sinking. The ensign is notable for its elegance and well-preserved condition. Though its delicate nature limits access to its details, after Simi's returned to the Confederacy, the flag was passed down through his family until it was donated to the state of Alabama in 1929 by his grandson, Raffle Simi's III. With that, we circle this video out to a close. I hope you guys did enjoy it, and I hope you guys did learn something. If you guys did, please pass this video on through a share, a comment, or even a like, so that another person can view it and hopefully learn something. I know I learned something during the creation of this video, as I had not learned about the Alabama, or her fate, or even her career, until just recently, within the past month. With that being said, again, I hope you guys did enjoy. Please leave a like, subscribe, leave a comment below, if you guys do have any questions, concerns, or even requests for a video topic. But in the long run, I hope you guys can enjoy, and I will see you all in the next one.